So our uh, guest speaker today is Professor Francesco Sanin. We are really very happy to have him with us today. Our professor, uh, Professor Sanin, going to present for us the city as a collective space where architecture can operate as a tool of social and political transformation. Uh, professor Francisco Sanin is a Colombian architect and educator. He is currently professor at the School of Architecture in uh, Syracuse University in New York. He has previously been a director of the architecture program in London and Florence, as well as chair of the graduate program. Sanin has taught in schools in different schools across the globe including uh, Princeton, uh, Princeton University, the Architectural Association, uh, Universidad U UPB in Colombia, the Korean National University of the Arts in Seoul, among others. Professor Sanin's work and research is in the history and theory of the city, with particular focus on the socio-political dimension of architecture and urbanism. In 2019, he was director of the Seoul Binali of Architecture and Urbanism in Seoul, South Korea. Professor Sanin is uh, going to discuss with us today uh, his very um, enlightened uh, perspective of the city as a collective space. So let me skip my, so my share. Professor Sanin, would you please share your screen? Thank you very much, Professor Mustafa. It's a, it is a real pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, I'm really very honored by your invitation to join you today and hopefully uh, be able to collaborate or give some uh, tools for thought, <laughs> food for thought, as we say. On, on the issues that concern us all about, uh, as you call it, the right to the city, the space and place making. Uh, it's always a little bit strange to talk about your own work. So I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do is uh, maybe share with you a number of projects across different scales and different uh, continents that hold in common a very simple idea. Uh, one that was obvious some time ago, uh, the idea that the city is a collective right. Or, uh, and I will start by um, sharing with you, maybe as an introduction, some thoughts that guide me when I was invited in 2019 to be co-director of the Seoul Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism in Seoul, South Korea. Um, and I proposed the name Collective City um, which sounds very obvious on one hand, because the cities are supposed to be collective and the history of humankind is one of working uh, together for mutual benefit and, uh, and survival. But as we know, uh, in our current times, we live in a, in a moment where the challenges to architecture, to urbanism, and to all of us as citizens range from uh, social inequality the crisis and uh, the challenges by the lack of housing and access for decent housing to uh, climate change. And they all talk about the, the, the issue of survival, both physical, but also in terms of social and political uh, manner. So in the Biennale, I'm not going to go into the detail, it was an effort to uh, create a global platform inviting architects literally from all over the world, not only from the Western world as most traditional, uh, traditionally, I say, Biennales do, but to be a point of encounter from uh, all the different continents, different voices, different experiences, different scales of reflection of what it is to construct the city today, what's the role of architecture and what are the responsibilities of architects and uh, government officials uh, and all the actors that are involved in the production of the city. The idea was to create this forum, uh, a sort of think tank, uh, but also an archive, something that would uh, grow over time as a form or a source of knowledge for the city. So it was a first attempt to, and I start at the end because this was a kind of culmination of many of the things you're going to see afterwards, uh, trying to bring together all these experiences uh, together to create really a, a sort of repository of knowledge that are of emerging strategies that might be available to many uh, around the world. Um, I'll start 
uh, by with a, with a rather autobiographical uh, example or or, or illustration uh, that is my hometown. I'm uh, from Colombia, from Medellin, Colombia. You probably are familiar with Medellin uh, as the city that, in the 1980s and 90s, was considered the most dangerous city in the world because of the drug cartels taking over um, the entire city uh, and therefore uh, society. Uh, it went from being a very, so let's say, normal, mid-sized uh, town into, uh, as I said, the most dangerous city in the world. And then uh, a process that I'd like to briefly refer to, which I think would frame maybe all the other conversations later on, is in in a, in a period of very short time, about four years, the city went from being uh, the most dangerous city in the world to be celebrated both for its use of architecture and urbanism as tools of uh, social and political transformation. And there is a um, the case is quite well known nowadays. It's been published just about everywhere and given prizes everywhere. But uh, I would like still to to have a look a little bit behind um, some of the of the process that weren't there. Um, I think the first thing that I recognize is that cities are places of conflict, um, meaning it's the places where we negotiate our life with each other. Uh, and that basically produces politics, culture, uh, social life. It is when violence takes over, as it did in, in Medellin, through this image that we all have now of Medellin through the TV series, that public space both literally and culturally is destroyed and the possibility of survival of a society really is threatened, is limited. Uh, <clears throat> to address that, uh, you had on one hand the role of the government and the military to recover, uh, let's say, social order. Uh, but it's a city also at the same time where a social and public space was impossible. You couldn't get out of your house without being afraid for your life that somehow managed to create spaces and events like this. There's a belief in culture. This is a, a poetry festival that would bring poets from all over the world and even the most uh, humble uh, working class uh, unemployed people would come to listen to poets even in languages they couldn't hear. So there was something about this sort of hunger for, for public space, for being together, for the value of culture that was at the base of what gave hope to the city, a city that had grown increasingly divided between the very poor and the very rich, the very poor living in a very precarious situation, but in spaces of, I, I would say, of, of quality, of the very poor, and the rich hiding in increasingly isolated towers and separated from the rest of society. Um, the story uh, probably is, is told by the, I don't know if you can see it properly, uh, a mayor, uh, Sergio Fajardo, that uh, came to power uh, through a social movement, not a political party, uh, and who came with a very specific political program. That he recognized that there was a deep social inequality, a historical debt that needed to be address so that bringing the police was not enough. We had to uh, create opportunities uh, and recognize that violence was based in inequality and the value of education as the element that would uh, construct a new potential for opportunities to happen. Uh, this is uh, where I would make a, a small parenthesis to say that be behind these uh, which is the most celebrated part of the, let's say, of the process. Uh, there was there were huge processes, uh, both in in the local level, in the communities, with social workers and even international NGOs working within the uh, communas to uh, bring communities together. But also uh, from the university, um, I would at the time I would be living in Europe, but I would come every year to work with the students and faculty in projects for the city, where this city that had no sense of hope, we were still thinking about what could be a way to reconstruct or regain a sense of public space, a sense of dignity and equality. Uh, it was... Everyone, alaikum. Sorry? 
uh, uh, it is a place where we even had uh, death threats. So we would have to be guarded by the police to run some of these workshops. But these projects were at the base of what the mayor, when he came in, um, where- Please do not disturb in between. Thank you. Uh, uh, so it was th these projects that we had done in the school were in a way the base or the, the mental map for the administration when they came in to, to do these projects. And these projects, uh, the credit that's belongs- so That's so impressive. Uh, that's so impressive. Excuse me, our guest, please uh, mute yourself. Um, uh, we need sorry, to, to have- I'm sorry, you I'm will, sorry. You will have time to ask Professor Francisco after he finished his talks. Thank I'm you sorry, very much. Sorry, sorry, ma'am. Your accent is very bad. <laughs> okay, no thank you. No problem. Thank you. Go so ahead, much. professor. Go ahead. Thank you. So, anyway, I'm, I'm so really sorry, ma'am. Please forgive me, ma'am. Please forgive me. My papa will marrying me. <laughs> no problem. So it's um, okay, bro. Don't. <laughs> So uh, the, the, the mayor's idea was that um, the, the historical debt would be to invest in the poorest part of the city at the time where other cities like Bilbao were bringing big stars like from Gary to do big projects. He said, we're going to do it with our own <laughs> local architects and in the places where maybe nobody will see the project, but they will have an effect in the community to bring uh, dignity. So it will be, from a cafeteria like this, simple like that, as something like this, from a school with barbed wires that existed at some point to schools that had all the computers and uh, I'd had the dignity to, to the place to go. Um, your voice is breaking. Okay, uh, I'll stop my video. Maybe that will help. Is that all right? Yes, yes, sir, uh, yes. Dr. Lubna, he seems to be a hacker. No, he is not a hacker. Could you kick him out, please, Doc uh, Dr. Lubna? Kick him out, please. Um, no, um, don't I kick am, out. No. Um, excuse me, uh, for everyone going to unmute himself, I am really sorry. Uh, this is not acceptable. If you have any problem, please take it in the chat area. For anyone going to unmute and they say uh, un nonsense, I'm going to take you off of the meeting. Thank you very much for respecting our rules and our talk. I'm really sorry, Professor Sanin. Would you please Don't continue? Ma'am, you are two three. Ma'am, you are two three. You are supari. Thank you. are supari. Ma'am, please speak in English. We are not able to understand you, bro. So uh, the, the, the projects that the, the, the um, mayor's office is created an office of special projects with a number of architects local. And they started to create what they call park libraries, places of education for the children, of um, education for uh, the parents to produce, to be able to uh, create a small businesses, a places of collective gathering uh, that in terms would connect to something that a previous administration had done, which was this infrastructure of, of gondolas, of metro cables, Comuna that were more, much harder to uh, have access through public transportation. So now the, the stations became sort of central points around which you begin to create a number of activities like schools, uh, entrepreneurship centers, uh, public libraries, public spaces. Uh, Professor Sanin, we can't hear you. Uh, I'm going to. 
Professor okay. Sanin, uh, we, we missed your voice for the past uh, three minutes, maybe. Okay. Sorry. Uh, here? Can, where you, was I here? I'm sorry. It's so many. To, uh, uh, so I was saying that there were uh, these strategies of reconnecting and giving access to the community to transportation was taking place at different scales, but also in different forms of uh, science museums, places of learning, places of gathering. Uh, commercial spaces, but they all took as a point of departure the need for the community to be part of the process, places of gathering. So even uh, as practical things as the sport installations were now developed as places of communal living, uh, of gathering together. Later on, even uh, infrastructure like these water tanks were transformed in community centers uh, like this one. Doctor, um, we're still missing your voice, Doctor uh, Sanin. No hackers with us now. So all of them, uh, we are clean, alhamdulillah. <laughs> but we can't can hear you your hear voice. Now? Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can. You can yeah, yeah, yes, we can hear it. Yeah, we can hear you now. It's a different voice, but I think it's you, Doctor Sanin. <laughs> yes. Okay, I'm so sorry. Uh, so I was basically saying That's okay. That's okay. how uh, this transformed the culture also of architects in the city that started creating an architecture that engaged with the public. So every opportunity, even a, a, a sport arena would become an opportunity to create public space, uh, an infrastructure of water tanks, then suddenly gate was had a area around it that then got transformed into a community center. The river edge, which used to be a highway now, has is becoming a public park connecting the two sides of the city. So there was this idea of moving from fear to hope. And it really, the way, the way it transformed the, the society was quite remarkable. Uh, it was funny that you mentioned the World Urban Forum, because in 2013, Medellin was the uh, guest of uh, the World Urban Forum, and I was asked to design the pavilion for the World Urban Forum, the Medellin Pavilion. So we designed this not only as a pavilion for an exhibition, but as a place of public congregation where people could come and understand the city, discuss the future of the city, engage with the public of the program. So they start with like a view of the city, they can walk and locate their own place. It was a, a drone view of the entire city to visualize it and a series of exhibitions explaining the different strategies of urban transformation that have been taking place in the city since then. So people could actually engage with the city, understand it and participate in the political processes, understand who were the participants, how had things happened, talk to each other and engage in conversations. So uh, this, this example of Medellin is a, it's an ongoing experiment. Uh, it varies a lot with the different administrations, but for a few years, it, it maintained a lot of continuity. Um, <clears throat> I was very proud to have been invited by the mayor, when the first mayor, when he finished his administration to be the coordinator of the, of the uh, let's say, academic programs to celebrate the transformation of the city. Um, so basically what I was trying to explain is how even from the university played a role in producing knowledge in, that then was applied through a political vision that then began to transform communities uh, and engage with those communities in a sort of dialogue where they, uh, as some of you said before, where the community was not asked necessarily what they want, because when they were asked what they want, they wanted a soccer field, but what they need, and they needed education. So they said, okay, we have a, a library, but we're going to discuss with you how we place it, where we place it. And in a way that kind of virus has started to take over the entire city, and now the city has been transformed at so many different scales and in so many different ways. So I, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to share with you that experience of which, uh, there are so many people to recognize as having value, 
but also how it ended up producing the spaces like this that the city constructed for dialogue with the community, for all the community to come and understand and reflect on what has happened and what will happen in the future. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me a second. Now I, I would like to, to move uh, to uh, a series of, uh, let's say, projects that I've done on my own uh, that somehow relate to this in, in, in different manners. Uh, this is a project in um, Monterrey, Mexico, uh, that where there is a, a very large campus or university campus surrounded by uh, a neighborhood that is falling apart. And as you probably know, like Medellin, um, Mexico has been going through uh, a really difficult time in terms of uh, um, that violence by the drugs. So I was called by the Monterrey uh, Technological, that basically the university, to develop an urban strategy uh, for developing the relationship or reconsidering the relationship between uh, Did you mute me or? Yes, we can hear you, Professor Sanin. Okay, so um, this is a very large project, took several years. Uh, I will not go into detail, but basically uh, it was a, a project where we had to engage with very different and, and difficult, uh, let's say, constituencies, uh, because there was a, a lot of, uh, as you can imagine, also drug-related violence in some of the areas, but we had a whole series of workshops working uh, in projects as small as a small kindergartens in some of these areas to larger scale urban design projects for the campus. And also later on, we, we selected one of the neighborhoods to implement uh, a strategy to test the possible strategy. It's a place that is really run down, uh, both the sidewalks, the, the, the urban fabric city ha people have left. So we start to think, how can we create a negotiation between the, the, uh, the technological and the city? Um, how to export the facilities of the university into the city and how to bring people back into the university. Uh, <clears throat> it started for things as simple as connecting across a highway, reconstructing the, the, the streets. Um, we developed a series of, uh, let's say, a strategy where people could have, we, we identified the fact that most of the uh, parcels in the city had very regular measures. So we developed a series of building types for each one of them. And for each one of them, a variety of apartment types that would include elderly, young couples, entrepreneurship uh, offices, and develop a system that allowed the owner of a particular plot of land to go to the city and because they already have these, they will be pre-approved and then the university would support them getting loans so they could actually redevelop their own building, making a profit, uh, bringing more people into, this, into the place and creating a sense of, of place and belonging uh, and reach, uh, let's say, mix of uses that would uh, produce a new community in the area. So we will see it uh, developing from the streets like these in time uh, transform over time from this maybe to this and then finally to that. Uh, and then we would produce a series of public buildings that would be supported by the university from uh, startups to uh, libraries to this uh, public park, which is now a very empty space into a community park where we would produce a series of elements that the, the, the community could play with literally like I said, play uh, board uh, that could develop over time and construct again a new uh, a new center that would activate and uh, attract people so that the, the parcels we saw at the beginning would become desirable people would like to move in and the local community would not be displaced but actually would be uh, taking advantage of this development to produce a new quality of space. Um, this is a little bit random. I apologize if it's uh, if it looks very strange, but I want to jump in the scales to something very temporal. Uh, so basically, to make the argument that architecture can make a big difference at many different scales, whether it's this urban plan, 
or the Medellin case or very small uh, interventions like this. I was in uh, 2011, uh, the Chinese architect Ai Weiwei and Korean architect Sung Hyo Sang were uh, directors of the Kwanju Design Biennale and I was invited to be the designer for the Biennale. So we took again the idea that an exhibition is a public space. Uh, but more important than that, uh, we wanted to take the exhibition outside of the building. And so this, this started something that's still going on, which is the idea of building a series of public pavilions around what used to be the old walls of the city. And this would be the architects we, that were invited, um, one of them, to build what they would call a folio or a pavilion to mark uh, uh, the memory of a series of events that took place in the city, but also to uh, commemorate the layout of where the old city walls were creating public spaces. So I created a very simple building that could view, has no specific use, uh, but could be appropriate in all kinds of ways uh, for performances, uh, for just people gathering together, or just at night talking to each other, a very simple building that would uh, enable and create, again, a sense of, uh, of place. And it has been so far quite successful. I'm going to skip this project because we don't have time to, to go through this. Uh, going back to uh, uh, Korea, where we started in the Biennale, as you know, Korea is this country that moved from one state to another in incredible speed. Uh, the urbanization of this of the city and the country has been amazing and um, it has you know, become the signature a single typology the apartment tower has become the, the kind of uh, image of the entire country that has become uh, an issue uh, because the traditional neighborhoods that were created are normally erased to the ground in order to pr produce this and so the, the mayor of Seoul, uh, before the Biennale, uh, wanted to test alternatives of how to make alternative models to these, and called on uh, 12 architects to uh, make proposals for this village, which is on the outskirts of, of, uh, of Seoul, where the demolition, where instead of demolishing completely, you would study uh, I mean, the, the constructions are decayed, it's almost abandoned, but where the idea of the topography, the scale of the streets, the typology of the courtyards and so forth would be recovered in ways that were alternative to this. So how can um, the city of Seoul begin to explore new forms of housing that don't, are not longer based in the, in the tower block? So I was given two of the areas on, on this part to explore and we we began working with the idea of traditional typologies uh, courtyard this is just a small part of the project um, and basically exploring different typologies that would include uh, some of the character of the space in the city um, it had a complete different scale uh, this is the forbidden city in Beijing and this is one of the hutongs uh, on the axis of the emperor we were asked by uh, Soho China to develop a project for the, again on similar vein to uh, make proposals that would capture or recapture the character of the place uh, without necessarily being nostalgic about the specific shapes of it. Uh, this is probably the project I wanted to get to because I, I find it uh, it's probably uh, is close to my heart and it hasn't been built, but I've just heard that it might be built finally by the new governor. <laughs> so the, the mayor of Medellin that I mentioned at the beginning became a uh, governor of the state of Antioquia where Medellin is. Uh, that state is here, uh, that being South America, of course. Um, he wanted to apply the same idea from Medellin to the, to the state. And so he started uh, developing urban plans for uh, about a hundred uh, municipalities uh, around the state and so he asked me to work as a sort of coordinator between the different departments of housing, urban planning, uh, schools to work with the different teams to bring this together. So the, one of the first events we did was to bring a hundred mayors from all the small towns around the state in a single space and we'd have these tables 
where we'll get together with them and the different members of the team uh, to collect all the information about what the resources they have, what problems did they have, what progress projects we could do together on how to collaborate. So um, there was a, a huge, very ambitious uh, plan to bring all this uh, uh, project that included uh, extensions to the city, sometimes it would be housing. Uh, it would be uh, a series of uh, participatory workshops with both the community, or in this case, for instance, on the bottom right, with, uh, with the architects working. Uh, there were also a series of a school or institution, educational institutions to be, uh, like about a hundred of them were built around the, the state. But the one that was closest to my heart is this uh, small town, which is the poorest on the state, is the farthest away, is in the middle of the rainforest, uh, it's mostly populated by uh, Afro-American descendants uh, that escaped from the slavery uh, in the 18th and 19th century and sort of went down this river and settled to be literally independent. Uh, as you move in this direction, you will find the, the mountains, the Andy Mountains, uh, where the Native Americans are still uh, tribes living in there. Some of them will come and visit here as well. Uh, it's a place that has uh, incredible poverty. This river floods um, regularly every year. It's completely out of communication with uh, any road or any place. Uh, you arrive, or I arrived, in this little plane uh, that lands on, on a piece of grass. Uh, two weeks after I arrived, the gorilla burned this, this plane, <laughs> so it's, it's very unsafe then you have to take a little canoe to get to the town. So, uh, and it's a town that is incredibly uh, scarce resources. Uh, it floods, so the whole town is built on pilotes. Uh, four months of the year, they have to uh, move in whatever medium they have. And both the mayor and myself, the governor and myself, we, we were quite uh, decided that it would be really important to make uh, a major investment in this town. Um, so we develop uh, as part of that a series of projects for new housing typologies, uh, for uh, new uh, stilt walkways. Some of them are falling down. The way that one day when we were there, uh, some of these were falling off. I don't have the pictures now, but some of them are really in bad shape. And there is a uh, a school at the end that they need to demolish because it has been damaged by the floods and they need to reconstruct the school and that's the, the latest project. So things like concrete are very precious, they're very difficult. Uh, this is one of the institutions that was built in there. So I was asked to, um, to design a school on the site of the existing school. Uh, and this is the school uh, that we designed. It is basically uh, an elevated walkway that allows the, the, the flood to, to continue. During the uh, dry seasons, uh, the underbelly of the school is a public space where they can have markets and sports. We preserve the, the ground of the existing school so it becomes a kind of plaza because concrete is almost impossible to get there. Uh, the stairs, as you can probably, as you saw, are the same way that you arrive into the town. So it, during the winter or during the flood season, it can operate as a harbor. Um, it is a public space for the city. Uh, it, it is a multi-purpose, very simple building uh, with a concrete base and wood and metal uh, top uh, that in the winter or in the uh, Flood season, it survives as a, as an end, uh, as a sort of almost like a boat. In the dry season, it operates uh, as a public space. And during the, 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 the winter or flood season, it becomes the only public space in the city. So we, we, are, we, we work with the mayor to say maybe the classrooms can be sort of programmed and designed so open that in the flood season, you can have emergency shelter, you can have dance clubs, you can have classes, night classes for adults. So in a way, the, 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 the building, although it's very simple, is designed to be the only public space that is in dry land during the winter season. 
Uh, I want to end up with this uh, project, which is a, a very different one, but it also addresses maybe uh, a range uh, or another example of, of working with a different sense of place. So if in this place was the river, the community and the flood, in here is the mountain and the topography. This is a, a very famous temple in South Korea. It's a Buddhist temple that contains in these two buildings at the on end uh, a fantastic collection of uh, tablets. It's the largest collection of, of Buddhist teaching in the world from 12 centuries ago. Uh, they've made in wooden blocks. There are 82,000 of them they used to print. Uh, the temple wanted to create a new extension. So the existing temple is there and we had decided it was a competition. And uh, so we, uh, this is our proposal, the winning proposal. We work on this for several years. It hasn't built yet, but I hope it will be built. Um, and basically what we wanted to do is to follow understanding of the way that traditional Korean, uh, let's say architecture and temple is made. And that it starts by creating a sense of place by carving the platforms, the sites on the ground. So in Korean architecture, traditional architecture, the buildings are very light, but they actually start by carving and creating spaces uh, from the most public to the most sacred. Uh, and that's how we start building the project from literally from the ground up, ended up in a temple, in a temple that is going to contain the copies in bronze of those 82,000 tablets. There are going to be three editions, one given to North Korea as a peace symbol, symbol other for the new temple, another for, uh, for the community. So this is, uh, these are images of, the, of that temple. Uh, um, just wanted to end up with this, which I think is a, is a great sense of play. This is a table where we usually sit with the chief monk to discuss the project. And this is the ceremony of sanctifying or blessing of the site of the construction of the, of the project. Thank you very much. I think that's, that's it. Thank you very much, Professor Sanin, for this very interesting, as expected, presentation. Um, and I'd, I'd like, I owe you actually apology for this hackers issue. I, I don't know from where they came. And uh, I'd like to apologize for our guest as well, because one of the hackers changed his, his name uh, to a seal name. By the oh. way, Asil of one of our members, and she's a very active member. I'm really <laughs> sorry, Asil, because he takes in behalf of her or under her name, very bad words in the chat. Uh, I'm really sorry because I had to close that chat and I had to close the meeting. Uh, I didn't allow many people to enter. I am really sorry. This is the first time to, uh, we face this in our coffee talks, and I'll have to email uh, Zoom. After we finish, inshallah, hopefully this will not repeat again. I'm really sorry, Professor Sanin. Don't <laughs> worry, us. don't worry. This is the world we live in these days, so don't worry. Uh, yeah, it but this, this, this is our first uh, meeting with uh, hackers. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully it would be the last. Okay, so we are going to open the ground for discussion. Uh, actually, I usually start with my personal question, but because I had uh, my part with you before we start, so uh, we can start with our guest, uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Khouli. I'd like to start with you, Dr. Ahmed, because we usually you usually have this uh, political uh, social perspective for every topic. <laughs> you can unmute yourself. Dr. Ahmed, can you, can you unmute yourself? Uh, you... Okay, now I it's working. Uh, thank you very much for uh, a very interesting presentation uh, that took us from one place to another uh, in the developing world from Latin America to Asia. Uh, let me first uh, say something about the projects, particularly those about uh, the city Medellin. Mm -hmm. uh, let me 
I have a question pertaining to uh, the decision making process within the uh, the municipality itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is an issue uh, that that I mean sometimes I mean it has been a subject for our studies about how most of those uh, public sector uh, mm -hmm. institutions are more opportunistic. Uh, they are not about sustainability, rather about maintaining the status quo. So I'm, I'm very interested here to hear from you how they changed the mindset. The mm -hmm. second question is about the fiscal impact of those projects. It's very important here because this is a, 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 an important or a crucial um, parameter for the sustainability of that invested effort and money. Uh, my third uh, question is about the environmental aspect. Like you, are, you, you planted and I can see that you are, your, your city and is in the middle of the, um, the rainforest. So what about the issue pertain, re, regarding um, introducing our, our the invasive species and uh, maintaining air quality and mm. that stuff? Because this is very important for the landscapers. And thank you very much once more for such a presentation. I will uh, mute myself so I can hear your response. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your comments. Uh, let me let me start uh, uh, at one point where the, um, the the city actually is not uh, in the in the in the rainforest, it actually is in the middle of the Andes, so it's actually surrounded by big mountains. It's, it's actually quite a pleasant, uh, or used to have a very pleasant weather, 27 degrees most all year round, <laughs> 27, 28, now it's a bit hotter. Uh, but it does have a lot of issues because there are a lot of water um, creeks that are coming down the hill, and one of the projects we don't have uh, I didn't have time to bring them all, was actually to channel and to move uh, people from their uh, uh, dangerous situations to uh, so that you could actually control landslides. So uh, now there is a, the, pro, the current administration is in the process of planting, I don't know, 100,000 trees. So that's becoming a, a more of the focus. But I think the most important part probably or the one that I can talk to most is the part of about governance that you mentioned. Um, the mayor came in with a very precise agenda, with a very political agenda that had to do with social justice and with uh, recognizing that the violence that was afflicting the city was rooted in inequality. So that the, it was not enough to simply send the police after the bad guys, but actually you have to change the community. You have to change the conditions. So uh, he, uh, he knew he couldn't change it all. So he chose the poorest area of the city. Uh, as I tried to show here that this is the, the, as you can see, the lighter green is the lowest index of human development. And they say, we're going to focus all resources there. So we're going to do everything from, um, markets to public spaces, to schools, to libraries, to sports centers in that area. And once we do it here and people are convinced that actually that can change, then we'll do it in other parts of the city. Uh, so after he did this, uh, I actually went with my students from the States. Think of this area as an area where in, uh, before he became mayor, the army would not go there. In about four years, I was there with uh, expensive cameras with all my students. Absolutely, this, it has changed. So in order to do that, he, he created a, uh, created a, a group called, uh, or not a group, a, 
a team called a special projects team that was separate from the urban planning office. Uh, the, the task of them was not to do urban planning, but develop this, what they call uh, integrated urban projects. Uh, strategic, <clears throat> so integrated meaning instead of doing um, across the city, we'll focus on this area, we'll, do, we'll bring uh, community uh, activists, we'll bring social workers, we'll do community workshops, and we will do it there. Uh, the money, which is always the question, uh, was partially because it's a, actually it's a wealthy city, also because one uh, enterprise that is partly uh, is public-private is the energy company. It produces a lot of money, and they said, well, we're going to get that money that was usually invested in infrastructure or highways, whatever. We're going to invest it in this public infrastructure. We're going to give the best buildings to the poorest people, so we're not going to do poor buildings for poor people. We're going to do the best architects in the city, in there. Um, and there was a whole other set of issues like transparency. So any, um, any project that was done in the city would be negotiated in public, in public spaces. As you saw later on in when we brought the 100 mayors, you know, it was all open. Anybody could walk in and see what was being negotiated, who was talking to whom. Uh, so there was an idea of transparency. There was an idea of investing very precisely in the community, building the community. It was so interesting that, you know, the, the, the mafia cartel that used to control that area, you know, they, they literally moved away because they realized that hmm, these people mean good, right? So they used to charge, the, <laughs> this is a, a story you don't tell very often, but they used to charge 20% the government to allow them to come in to do any work. And then they said, no, because you're really doing something good for us, we won't charge you. You use that money to do better, uh, like sidewalks, right? So uh, streets like the one I show you uh, that were just open streets suddenly were transformed into public spaces. Uh, it went from being 20 shops to be over 200. So it transformed also the economic life of the community because people could have now a bar in front of their house. They could have a, a hairdresser salon. They could have a bar. They could have, uh, you know, a massage parlor, whatever, and have also new forms of income. So even if though you didn't transform the housing, you transform the conditions of the city of the of the community. And also you have things like uh, in the library parks, you would have uh, computers for kids that probably wouldn't even have a TV at home. They could go to the library and go into a computer and connect to any form of education. And I tell you, I've met twelve-year-old hackers that you would be amazed of what they could do. Uh, so it has become, it, it sort of created transformation in, in, in the culture of the city that was really amazing. From the fiscal point of view, uh, the, as I said, uh, the, it, there was a big investment. And one thing that happened is because at that point, as I told you, everybody was afraid to leave home, right? And as the city started to transform itself and become safe to go out, rich people now were willing to pay taxes which were, they were avoiding before, because now they said, oh, my kid can go out, right? My kid can go out safely. I, I don't have to be praying for my kid to come back from school, right? So now I, I'll be glad to pay my, pay my taxes. And there were also projects in the, you know, the wealthy areas as well. So um, it, it created a cycle that started with very small things and then somehow grew over time at different scales in the city. I hope that answers your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahmoud, for uh, this very uh, interesting question. And thank you, Dr. Um, Sanin, for um, thank you. the unexpected thank you. answers. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for uh, elaborating on that. And uh, if I may uh, say that what you just mentioned today in the presentation, that at the heart of social transformation, it's about good governance, adopting yes. and applying uh, good governance. And it's about changing the mindset of the administrators. Yeah. Okay. So that's how they uh, gained the trust of the public at large. And that goes back to as you started your presentation by 
the right to the city mm -hmm. in a, a Harvey and Lviv uh, tradition or definitions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, could you uh, mention or discuss something about uh, how you dealt with uh, historical areas and uh, play, I mean, uh, monuments and something like this within this urban transformation? And before that, I would just want to tell you something that happened in my city, Cairo. Uh, years ago, uh, the case actually, uh, the Arachan Foundation mm -hmm. was working in uh, the historic part of Cairo, Darb al Ahmar. And one of the things that one of uh, the stories I've heard from one of them, of their team, that the drug dealers maintained the monuments and the mosques, the <laughs> historical ones, because they used to keep the drugs there. <laughs> so that was a, something good for the monument. Once they drove them out, unfortunately, many of the parts of the, the mosques and the, these historic buildings were ripped out to be sold on the market right. uh, as souvenirs. So maybe, I mean, I would like very much to hear something about that from, from your experience. Thank right. you once more. Of course, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I should tell you, I, um, this is a project that is not mine. These are projects by many people, many people, as I tell you, from uh, urban designers to architects, uh, you know, a whole generation of architects emerged in this area. Some of them had been my students. One of the things that the, the mayor did was he was told now you have to brand the city. You have to invite like big star architects. And he said, no, we're going to make with local talent and we're going to make it, maybe nobody's going to look at them far away. Uh, so there's a whole generation that grew up uh, doing these projects. Uh, and, but just, to, just I don't want to claim uh, authorship of things that are not mine, <laughs> uh, but in the, uh, let me see if I, yes, uh, let me see if I can share with you. Um, so um, the city, as I explained before, you know, uh, I mean, this could be, I'm sorry, this, this can be a two hours lecture alone, but um, <clears throat> the, the city ha is a very complex city, uh, but uh, this, uh, this is the historic center. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, this is the historic center of the city. This is a node that has a public park, a university, and a, and a botanic garden. And here is sort of inheritance of Le Corbusier, an administrative center. Um, so this is the what we call historic center, which is mostly 1950s and 60s modern buildings. So the administrative center, which is the Le Corbusier areas where some of these big public spaces were generated. But this is the center. Um, for instance, this is a major street with some very important public buildings. Some of the oldest buildings in the city were refurbished, renovated on a pedestrian street uh, constructed to, uh, you know, to improve the quality of life. I'm personally not that big fan of pedestrian streets, but uh, but basically what was done, what what I wanted to show you is that it's part of a uh, of an idea of connecting different parts of the city through this uh, corridor that is a historic street. So uh, there were also, you know, renovations of historic building, but this is probably a, a good image that tells you how uh, the city, in a way, combines us at the end. You can see 1940s and 50s uh, modern buildings and, and historic buildings unified through public space. So yes, it was, that was a, a very important part of the, of the project. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmad, Dr. Sanin. Uh, the floor is still open for um, other questions. Alopna, please. Am I allowed? Yes. 
Yes, of course. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. And I was wondering, like some of these developments, especially when we develop new buildings and, and I, I heard you mention often that um, there were the plans and we, you were still hoping that they would be built. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I also see in your work that it's a lot of participatory work where you're engaged with the community and, and you talk together what, you, uh, what the community needs. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, how do you deal with that kind of time frame? Um, something that I find really difficult in my work to engage people early on, mm -hmm. but also to keep them engaged and keep them informed and start building from early on, um, knowing that the project might take five to 10 years to, to, right. to realize. How, um, how do you um, <laughs> deal with that in your work? You know, it varies enormously according to the context. Uh, for instance, in Mexico, the university had to start uh, constructing, a, let's say, a community of people. So we have to identify community leaders, uh, people in the in the area that uh, would have some kind of investment, uh, create events, uh, you know, markets or festivals or music or food. So people will come and then we will engage with them. So it had to start from very simple uh, forms of engagement. Uh, and then, in a way, bringing them into the conversation. Uh, uh, we would have to create different, what they call stakeholders. So we'd have to have meetings with the, with the, with the city administration, with the, uh, let's say, the governance of the, of the university system, which is a very large one and very reticent to, to invest in social issues at the end. Uh, with the local community, you know, whether more the business owners or the uh, unemployed. And in that case, it was really, uh, this is still ongoing. I mean, I'm no longer involved in it, but it's still ongoing by the university. In the case of, uh, uh, for instance, the, the smaller school and all these projects, there was an incredible um, infrastructure of people or resources of people, you know, that I, I'm completely of, of social workers that could go I mean, uh, I don't mean to be, uh, uh, not sorry. Uh, I don't mean to be facetious, but you know, uh, let's say upper class white young women who uh, wear, you know, makeup, high heels, get on, a, on, a, on one of those little airplanes and they're scared to death. They are willing to spend a week in this town in the most uncomfortable situation, just to work with people, you know, to do, and they have been trained to work, you know, it's sort of, it goes beyond participation. It goes into theater and play to get people to trust us, you know, to understand mm -hmm. that we mean it, uh, that we can communicate. Uh, it takes time to make them understand that in a city like that, or in a place like that, you don't want to build buildings in brick like you do in the city, which is what they want. But mm -hmm. that they have their own dignity and their own tradition, and that we can do what they have been doing in a way that is dignified and it will give dignity to their own culture without having to look like others. So these are really difficult uh, processes. Uh, you know, in that case, it's just the team was amazing. I mean, yeah, they're, they're really remarkable. On the other hand, for instance, in Korea, we had a huge, uh, uh, let's say, fight between uh, the developers who wanted to convince the community leaders that they would earn more money if they built towers. And they were playing really dirty tricks uh, and mm -hmm. asked them to convince the community that this was their place, they had built it over years and that it belongs to them. Uh, so each case is so different that you have to somehow be very, I guess, resourceful or flexible to, to adapt to what you have. Mm -hmm. Do you also use, like, um, for instance, the school as the end result? Um, um, but it, it depends on, on the finances and a lot of decision making to whether it's yeah. built or not. Um, are you also working with temporary results or temporary solutions? So in, in order to, to bridge that gap between the, the process and the community building and, and really materializing 
on some of the ideas? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in, you know, where that's possible, especially when there is a larger time frame, uh, we do. Uh, like in Medellin, you probably would start with uh, what we call imaginary workshops. Mm -hmm. So you would get people, you know, an idea of a library, and then you ask them to elaborate what it is. You would have to also bring maybe the mother of a victim to be in the same room with maybe the people who killed them, right? And that was really uh, difficult. But there would be a lot of like celebrations, literally, I mean, like setting up a, a, a music or a reading, or as I show you, you know, poetry or dance, uh, some temporary events that begin to give people a sense that that place has a meaning and that there's something coming there in order to make it permanent. So by the time it's built, uh, there's a meaning to that. We had that experience in Mexico where uh, before I came, uh, they had fenced an area around uh, in, this, in, in, in one of these uh, neighborhoods and built a fantastic community center. But it was fenced in, they never saw it. One day the fence came down and nobody went to the community center because it meant nothing to them, right? But if you start by uh, creating events, you know, as I said, play, theater, people begin to be engaged and have a sense that, yes, something is coming. Uh, for instance, the mayor of Medellin, he would have a bi-weekly TV program live where he would announce, you know, there's a competition. The, the next week, this is the winner. Then this mm -hmm. is the, the builder. Uh, this is the people who are going to be there. Uh, People can call live and he would answer the questions. So there was a, a whole, you know, as you say, there's a lot that happens behind the scenes that is it's really complex, but really interesting, yeah. Thank you. Sorry for, I give a very long answer, but it's-, it's No, it's no, no, it's, it's wonderful. I'm just yeah. also thinking about, I mean, I see that Nadi uh, Nassar is also here. He lives in Beirut. So um, I'm also curious to hear from him yes. further yeah. down the line to whether you recognized and, and how this works with the community building that's now happening in Beirut. Um, and I know you, you're involved in that. But I also saw that Mohammed Abu Samra was having and wanted to ask a question. So we are enjoying your answers, by the way, Professor Sanin. Feel free to elaborate as much as you feel uh, <laughs> it's going to uh, enlighten us, actually. Uh, we have a question from Neji, then a question from Mohammed. And hopefully, there are many questions because I have two keeping them to the end. <laughs> Neji, please unmute yourself. Uh, I don't really have a question. I mean, uh... No, Nadi, I was just wondering in, in, in comparison to what's happening in Beirut and the rebuilding there, do you see like how are collective spaces um, being developed there? And do you recognize anything from what Professor Sanin just told you? Uh, it's, I don't know, because the, the process of Medellin, uh, the case of Medellin is very famous among uh, urbanists. Uh, but the process professor uh, described is very, very long. Uh, so, so far, I mean, the, if we're talking about Beirut's uh, reconstruction from the last explosion, it was six months and it was in the context of COVID. So everything was extremely, extremely slow. Uh, everything, I mean, the, the financials, the, the, the way people work, uh, and a lot of things changed uh, since last December because uh, winter came and the uh, and there was a recent surge in the epidemic and a full full lockdown. So I still can't describe the process of virtual reconstruction as a whole. Uh, and there wasn't one of the main difference also is that there wasn't a uh, how, how can I say a, a leader uh, or an authority. Um, it, it's not like lacking the, the wonderful the mayor. mayor of Medellin. Yes, yes. I mean, to, to have such a leader, and as you said, who, who would give regular updates to, uh, to everyone, e even if it was already public information, like contracts or contractors or uh, winners of the competition. I mean, even if it's already public information and publicly available data, he would just announce it for everybody to be aware. So um, there are definitely a lot, a lot of lessons that we can learn from the Dominion case uh, in, uh, well, I was going to say third world countries, but it's not relevant anymore. But in, in cities that have similar issues, similar struggle, criminality rates, and uh, 
lack of uh, public uh, participa participation. So, yeah. I have to say that uh, uh, I personally don't like the third, this way of calling third world countries. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I rectified uh, myself. I mean, the no, word no, came I, to my head, but no, I, I, I know it's I saw it. I, I saw it. That's why I feel free to say it. No, I don't mean to contradict. I actually like the way you, you said it because one of the things I have learned is that some of the most, especially during the penal, is that some of the most interesting lessons about the city are coming actually from not from the center, what we used to call the center, but from this, the, the countries that are emerging or somehow uh, uh, that are confronting creative ways, uh, the, the challenges, right? And, you know, sometimes we are lucky where there's a coincidence in Medellin where, you know, the, the, the university, the, the entrepreneurial class, the working class come together to do something. In other cases, it's uh, like in Mexico, it's really scattered, but, there are always these kind of, uh, you know, when you look around, uh, again, I, I was looking at uh, a project in, 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 in Kinshasa, in Lagos, in other places where also there's a lot of creativity going on, happening, right? And, um, in, we had projects in Cairo and the Biennale. And I, I'm fascinated by, by the way that we can be resourceful and respond to very specific conditions if we have a project, right? And I think that's the wonderful thing is that we have a project about that we have a right to the city and that architecture can, in a very small way, can create big transformation that we don't need to make huge plans, but that sometimes very small things can make big changes. You know, the, the, the thing of Medellin is that the big transformation, the one that really made the, the, the impact was done in four years. Everything, almost everything I show you was done in the first four years, right? Except for the park of the, of the, of the uh, along the river. Uh, uh, and that's that's quite remarkable uh, to, to have that, that kind of transformation. But uh, as as you say, we, we all have to face different uh, conditions and be you know, recognize them and see who who can we talk to, and what tools do we have to talk to them and to convince them. You know, convince them that it's in their own benefit. For instance, to administration and politicians that to do something good and. Um, make it for them, because if you ask them to do it, they will not do it <laughs> most of the time. I would, I would love to learn more about what, what you guys are doing in Beirut. I really love to. Especially because they tell me that I, I look Lebanese, so. <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess this is the Mediterranean look, so. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> dark eyes and sometimes dark hair. And <laughs> okay, uh, so Abu Samra, you have a question. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, first, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sain, for uh, this interesting presentation. Um, I would like to ask uh, two questions or comments, mainly. One of them is about uh, yes, we, we agree that uh, the, the role of architects and urban planners in the transformation of Medellin was great. But I think the greater role was for this great major, mayor of, uh, of, uh, of Medellin. He has a great role. To what extent uh, does the mayor have the freedom to do whatever he thinks right for his city? And also, uh, for, for when he was uh, when he then became uh, a governor, uh, so he might have uh, more more uh, I mean, authorities to do what what he thinks right. So this gives us uh, a question about the level of decentralization in the whole country, the decentralization of of. Uh, that that goes to the, the the smallest city or the smallest village to have a decision maker to make uh, such uh, uh, radical changes in in the city. That's number one. Number two, it's about unity. Uh, I mean, uh, not only in these uh, in in in, uh, in these changes, but also in managing the creation of public spaces. Uh, we know that uh, Medellin was uh, one of the most dangerous cities in the world, then it's now safe city. So 
and we hear the, the, the term of uh, community policing or community participation in, in managing the public spaces so that it is safe places or safe public spaces. So uh, did the community have uh, a, a, a significant role in, in managing or policing the public spaces or the upgraded public spaces? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, uh, the answers are, are, are a little bit complex. Uh, we are going into the history of Medellin, but I think one, one thing that um, as I go around, let's say the world, and people look at Medellin, uh, they have a very, let's say, limited view. Uh, in a way, the mayor appears a kind of magician uh, and a couple of architects like make it all happen. Uh, the truth is that behind it, there was before the mayor, uh, there was a participation of the um, national government, international NGOs working with the communities already. So there was a work that was done in a very important manner of creating and constructing uh, community networks, uh, addressing the issue of violence and inequality. There was also a, a significant amount of studies done at the university, both studies, analytical study, but also projects, right? like the idea of re, uh, recognizing, you know, criticizing urban planning and becoming more active about public space and a smaller scale to empower communities. Uh, so, um, so the mayor appears at it's sort of as a key moment, like where he comes, his father was an architect, by the way, and his father was actually the dean of the School of Architecture at some point. It was a very famous architect, modernist architect. So he grew up with architects and, you know, we, we actually, we, we knew each other since childhood. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, uh, so when, when he came to power, he was already in, in, with, with a set of, let's say, tools to play and with a very precise political vision that he brought from the civic movement, right, which was an alternative to the traditional government parties. That was accompanied by the fact that um, because Colombia was, has suffered from um, violent, political violence for a long time, that there was a change in the constitution that, as you say, also gives more powers to local uh, governments. So what he was very clever was bringing, uh, moving along, you know, a very specific project that had to be done. And basically he had the power to do it. And he said, this is how we're going to do it. We're not going to be messing around with this. I'm going to create a special group because the planning office is not going to do it because they're used to doing, you know, bridges and, and zoning codes. We're going to do these projects here. I'm going to use the money that comes from this energy company and we're going to invest it into here. I'm going to transform that. So there's a lot of credit to him, absolutely, in his vision. But it's always important to understand that it was not a magic moment. It was the result of many different processes coming together. Uh, so uh, the, 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 his power was without a conviction, right, of, of convincing people by, as you say, you know, being public, being transparent, allowing people to look into all the finances of the, of the, of the city. Every contract was negotiated in public. Uh, so it opened up. Now, since then, uh, there have been different mayors. Some of them have continued the, the, the idea, others not. So it's not a given, right? Like now I'm not so sure that Medellin is such a bright example as it was 10 years ago. You know, there are all the problems that are emerging that things happen, right? You, you have to, mm -hmm. You begin to take it for granted. You know, people begin to take it for granted. Uh, in in, in uh, at, at the state level, uh, it was far more complicated because you know every mayor had their own power. So in Bahia, we had to convince the mayor that that was important and so forth. But it were, you know there were projects built in the city, as I show you. Uh, now the new governor uh, has reached out and said, you know, that because the school was finished by the end of his mandate. And now there's a new governor and they have reached back to me. They really want to do it. So fingers crossed next time we talk, hopefully we'll be built. Thank you very much, Professor Sanin. Uh, so are there any uh, more questions? Well, perhaps maybe a remark to, to what we were discussing, like, do we need the mayor? 
do we need um, you know the, the the good governance um, to, to make it happen to to really go and get collective areas and 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 create safe spaces and I think um, what is very important and I think you're also saying that Mr. Sayin is that um, you have to have good groundwork. Mm -hmm. And so there is lots of people already engaged. And, and I think a lot of the contributions that we can do as professionals, um, if we're in a situation where um, the political system is not helping us, is not um, realizing the importance of public space or a good urban uh, structures, is that we can work on spatial literacy. Yes. And, um, and, so and something... What I, what I find a lot is that many of, of us humans in the city don't realize the, um, the, the, the power that we have to make small changes ourselves mm -hmm. um, by starting facade gardens, by cleaning up little areas around us, by uh, collaborating with our neighbors and setting up small gardens, community gardens. There's so many things that we can do and, and often I find that when I work with people, they say, I wasn't sure I was allowed to do that. I didn't know how to start. I didn't feel comfortable. Um, and there's so much that you can do by just addressing spatial literacy and helping people realize the small changes that they can make themselves. Um, because that is also triggering others to say, okay, I'm the shopkeeper. I see people in my street doing good things. How can I help? And, and then you can have a little small snowball and at least not feel um, uh, so dependent uh, mm -hmm. uh, on others. And also a mayor or any politician or any civil servant can only do so much. I mean, he can mm -hmm. have the vision, but if there's no people on the ground to work with, um, not much will change. Absolutely. So I think that might help us from getting frustrated that we don't have <laughs> mayor of Tirana or of Medlin or no. other great cities who did have that advantage. No, but what you're saying is so important. If I may just reinforce what you said, because I, I tried to say it and I, I wasn't clear, is when we were doing the projects uh, during the time that the city was under the drug cartels, we were doing projects, as I told you, under army protection at the university because we'd received death threats for doing this project. So it was a moment of hopelessness. You, know, you couldn't mm -hmm. even dream that the city was going to change. You, you just kept out of the power of conviction. And without those visions, the mayor, who is not an architect, would not have had the tools to do it. He wouldn't probably have done something completely different. So it was because he, we had, as you say, spatial literacy. I like that term. You know, we had a vision that was spatial about the value of public space and uh, public buildings and infrastructure that the mayor was able to do what he did and we were able to implement it because he had the vision so in a way we have to create the condition as you say and and also understand that you can start small that you don't always need the mayor absolutely so thank you for for the comments yeah uh, can i just add something here to the discussion mm -hmm. uh, Please. Yes, please. Yes. I think uh, architecture and the physical uh, setting in a city is the outcome of the economic, political, institutional setting. And I think the starting point is to believe in uh, the principles of good governance into enabling and empowering the people. Without that, any attempts, even on a very small scale, if it is there, it will not survive and it will not be sustainable. Because as I mentioned before, it's about changing the mindset in decision-making and empowering people. Other than that, the architect at the end of the day or the planner, they are serving uh, the capital and the administration, the, the bureaucracy, and bureaucracy, in my opinion, kills any innovation. I mean, it's they are. I mean, bureaucrats 
are there because they want to maintain the status quo. They are don't want to think outside of the box. That's how they they earn their bread and butter, and that's it. At at the end of the day, they want to shut it down, and so that's. But to innovate, that means you have to change the paradigm, make a paradigm shift. That made means you have to change the product you're offering. And you have to rethink the position of the city and the people and the society at large. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you have to th rethink the, the process of overhauling the city, branding it and reviving those uh, areas. So a bureaucrat will not do those. They will not be doing this. And that goes back, if we go to the literature and the planning theory about what planners do and the different schools, even if we speak about participation, participation should not be an end. It should be an, a mean. Mm -hmm. Do the yeah. transform me. Right. Thank you. No, I, I think you know the, the interesting thing I, I believe in the case of Medellin is that it works both ways. Like I mean, without the governance, uh, nothing would have happened. But without the buildings, with the actual buildings, actually changed also the mindset. It was the buildings because people saw that actions were being taken. That they the, the government was not there just to collect votes or to speak words, uh, actually they had now the resources, they had a library, they had a, a, a playground, there were institutions teaching them how to uh, educate themselves, how to find jobs, they have spaces for the market. So it was actually the physical transformation of the city that also transformed the, uh, uh, the, the culture. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not denying that because I, I tru truly believe in what Winston Churchill said that we yeah. build the buildings, then we live in them and they transform us. Right, it absolutely. It starts by the decision-making, how the decision-making, mm. uh, you, you just mentioned about how they move the money, reallocated the money mm. from one budget line to the other, which made the difference. Other than that, it, the, the physical uh, settings will not be there. Right, right. I mean, the, 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 what, what I'm trying to say is that it, it's a complex economy. It's not one direction. It works in different directions. Like, for instance, it was through uh, similar sort of dialogues that, like bringing the example of Medellin to Korea, that the mayor of Seoul also started to think, oh, maybe we need to find other ways of doing things. So he has the power and one, if you have the vision, then you can... Uh, talk to those in power, but also I think, you know, we could have another discussion uh, about, you know, also bottom-up activities from urban gardens to community building that also have big effects because they create an expectation. They create the example of, oh, if they can do it, why cannot we do it, right? So uh, I, I find it interesting that it is it's, it's circular, you know, it works mm -hmm. in, in both directions. Uh, architect Sami Haddad, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Lubna, for bringing uh, such a speaker, Mr. Francisco. Thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, I like it very much. Uh, let me start with this. Um, place making is never ended, and it is not uh, a design, but it is in a process and thinking process and people participation. Uh, you think to what level people could uh, participate and they have vision of what they need exactly and how you as a conducted uh, researcher rise their level of thought and uh, request? This is first uh, question. Uh, second question, how long it takes uh, such studies, the, you, the one you presented, and the third one, and the last, uh, as such a study is how much it costs approximately uh, if a project like and same area with same almost conditions. Thank you very much.
Uh, I'm totally sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, could you repeat the questions again? Because I'm not sure I caught them. The, the third, the, the last one is about the cost of the of the projects. Yes, mm -hmm. the, the first one, mm -hmm. uh, place making is never ended, mean mm -hmm. it need a lot of effort after it's finished. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is not designed uh, because uh, people are supposed to create the, what they want. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. My right. question, to what level, to what extent people, or we respect them people by their request, especially if they are like poor people, crime people like the downtown in Sean, in some cases, you want, you want as a planner or designer or discipline, write mm. their vision to a much higher quality than they're thinking. And same time, mm. you, you want to compromise between uh, the, the thoughts, principles, and people. Right. Uh, you know, it, it's that that question for me is really important uh, because uh, one of the first thing I tell my students is that the role of the architect or architecture is not a place to where you express yourself or to be creative or to be a star. That we have a responsibility to the public, right? So one of the things that this uh, let's say process for me question is the idea that. Architecture is somehow about, uh, you know, what we call archi stars, right? expressing myself. I think you, you should do art or go to psychologists. <laughs> uh, the architect really has to, one of the things I, I would say is question what is the right, uh, what's the role of architecture? And sometimes, for instance, in, I, I was trying to look for an image of Medellin where there was a, a, an area where it's really in very bad shape. And then uh, let me see if I can find it because it might be illustrative of, of what I'm trying to say. You give them, uh, if you give them a, a platform, uh, people then transform it themselves. Uh, so in a way there's a dialogue between the two, I guess is what I'm saying is that placemaking also requires some basis. So for instance, this was, can you see it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. This, this was an area in, in, in that neighborhood uh, that was created by the demolition needed for the, this, that then was uh, reconstructed with very simple means, just a sidewalk and so forth. But then the effect was that this house was like this, then this came in, and then people now, this, this is a two story house in brick with a shop underneath. So it transformed, people appropriated and created that. So there's a dialogue that this sidewalk, as simple as it is, enable the quality of life and the sense of place of these families to create a uh, space, right? Uh, same thing with this guy that suddenly becomes a space where people then now have barbecues and, and, and have a sense of place and, and, and appropriation. So what it tells us is that we, you know, if I was uh, a traditional architect, I would be making like the most interesting form, but sometimes what you have to do is the most simple basic thing, so people can appropriate it and they take place, they, they can take ownership. And the case of that um, example, I think it was, it was interesting for me, uh, as was, uh, for instance, this other one, which is the, the this was uh, a street that was really badly, you know, big street full of buses. The, the administration built this kind of pedestrian big sidewalk with little places for shops. And this was now people appropriated. So this dialogue between what you do and what you allow people to then build upon once you have there. So that architecture is not the last word, but it's actually uh, an enabler, as you say, as I believe you're saying of, of, of what uh, people can do with it. So rather than to put your stamp to be recognized as the architect is how you are uh, an enabler of other things to happen. Right? It's anticipating working with time as well, how things might, people might use in time. And sometimes you really surprised in a very pleasant way. About the, the cost of the studies sometime, can you give us a rough ideas in general, it's not specific, 
uh, like uh, this studies and execution? No, I, I can't at the moment. I don't have that because there are also huge difference of projects between the scales of different projects. So no, I don't have it. I'm afraid. Sorry. Okay. The the third the last one. This let me know the disciplines that work in this project. What type of disciplines like architect, urban designer, landscaper, um, social economics? Let let us just give I mean give us idea about this, please. Sure. Uh, it was a well. There was a, a originally there was this special projects group that was uh, led by uh, architects uh, with training in urban design rather than in planning. So they were not really planners. They were uh, architects um, coordinated by the mayor, uh, working with the community with, uh, of course, economists, uh, but mostly social workers uh, who were very specialized in working with the community. I think those these were the key uh, people that make the bridge between the worker, the, the, the sort of architect's vision of, of uh, how they read the community, where to locate the library, where to locate the, the market. The mayor that said, we need the resources and we need to do that. And the community that said, you know, if you're going to do a library, it has to be, it has to have a reading room. It has to have a computer room. We need a, an archive, a, a history room where we keep photographs of how our past was, the victims of the conflict where we can celebrate where we come from. Uh, and we have these special rooms where, that are photographies and memories of the conflict so we don't pretend it never happened. So that was proposed by the community, for instance. That's mean any change in microeconomics in this case, in this case like if Meyer is giving uh, the report, for example, that means or I assume that he contacted a research and program for area uh, mm -hmm. for uh, activities needed. Mm -hmm. And that's lead us to increasing also the microeconomics of uh, social socioeconomics. Exactly. How does that, could you like, could you please highlight it in this uh, uh, segment of, 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 of questions, please? Yes. Uh... If I understand your question, it is a little bit what I was referring before. Like if uh, the, uh, the, the, let me see if I can. So the, the, the municipality would come and recognize that everybody uses the, 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 the station. So they walk across here. So that space became, becomes a market. And next to the market in this area here, there is a, an entrepreneurship center. So small loans, bank, courses of how to set up your business. You go to the, uh, to the library and you can study a craft. Then you can come to this place and get training of how to make a loan, how to set up your business. Then you can sell your stuff in here. Uh, you can go to this market in the weekends to sell new things. So in a way, there's an economic cycle that begins to happen. And as this that was created by the municipality, then these streets begin to be improved and people begin to have businesses that grow. And uh, so they, they improve their, their uh, economic standard. Is that what you were asking? Yes, yes, sure. Certainly, that is good. Good, great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. I think uh, we have only eight minutes uh, to finish. Uh, if you allow me, I have uh, two questions. I try to make them very short. Uh, one of them is regarding the stakeholders management. Usually before getting uh, uh, the start of uh, any uh, project involving the community, we have to make that stakeholders analysis. And it was really amazing for me that you listed the cartel as one of the stakeholders. And it was your uh, gate <laughs> to work and implement your work. So, um, I'd like to know uh, within your, this very wide perspective of your projects among many cities and many countries actually, uh, do you have the, that, uh, did you face that much differences between the stakeholders holders mm. from uh, a project to another? or you faced a relatively uh, different weight for the stakeholders. 
This mm-hmm. is the first question. The second question is regarding the uh, social impact assessment. Uh, do you usually process social impact assessment uh, before starting the project or not? Thank you. Wow. A lot of very difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel uh, humble that I, I'm not able to give uh, complete answers. Um, in the case, for instance, of, of Medellin, just to give you a very silly answer, uh, the first person I, I, I still keep in touch with him was a very young architect who was sent up into the Comuna to literally find out. And he used to tell me that when the first one there, they were, uh, he discovered that the collective places where the women were cleaning the laundry, those were the peace centers. That's where the places where no conflict could take place. So if you wanted to have a peace negotiation between gangs or to bring the government, you have to go to that place because that was already recognized as sacred by then. Next to them, there would be a tank where they would have fish and they would name the little fish according to their colleagues that were dead. <laughs> so you understood there was already a, a big culture that you need to engage them if you wanted to come inside. Right? So it's a very specific, silly example, but uh, this young man was brave enough to go first and, and discover that. And that became in a way one of the entry gates to recognize who the state stakeholders are because sometimes you don't know, right? You don't know who's calling you. Like in, in, in Monterey, I knew that the university had taken in a way the role of the state, at least in the beginning and say, if the state is not doing it, maybe the university has to do it because we have a, a stake in recovering the area around us because our students cannot come into the campus safely. They not, can, cannot have housing next to the university safely and things are coming down. So we knew that that was one stakeholder. We knew that the, you know, the city was a stakeholder. But then, as I said, we have to build up our own community through all these festivities to know who were there. Because in many cases, like in Mexico, there were almost no people living in the area, very few. So you have to engage with them and you have to discover who they are. So in a way, sometimes you have to construct the stakeholders. They don't always, they are not always there. Um, in terms of social assessment, you know, I, I normally don't, I, I don't conduct post-occupancy or uh, evaluation. So we keep, I like to keep track on things, but I would say that before, uh, it's what informs you, right? I mean, that's the title of, our, of the presentation. It's, it's the intention is how can we think of architecture differently from just making, you know, interesting objects or beautiful buildings into our architecture that is deployed to create social change, right? How can we use architecture to enable uh, empowerment, sense of place, social transformation, dignity? So that's the kind of social vision you bring already that changes the way you think about architecture. So I'm not, let's say, I don't consider myself a traditional architect like some of the people you see in the magazines making the latest opera house or, or anything like that. So I'm much more interested in in what tools can we use to create social change? So, so it's already a way of looking at architecture in terms of, of that, as opposed to separate, I guess. Uh, I think a social impact assessment from the perspective of working with community will be more um, efficient than the theoretical one because you will not predict what community wants and you will not predict what co- how the community will react. Actually, you will know what the community wants and how they will react. Um, maybe the, the traditional perspective of social impact assessment uh, is not the, the best one but uh, working with a social impact assessment, maybe it's a good way to present for the authority. Mm-hmm. Because usually this conflict in, in our countries, <laughs> there is usually a, a normal, uh, usual conflict between what the authority think people want and what people really want. So you have to take it uh, through the very scientific method. So the mm-hmm. social impact assessment telling that people will accept because they already uh, involved in the design process, in the planning, pre-design mm-hmm. process. And by, the, by this, you know how they are going to react. So, or, or this is my, my personal perspective for the social impact assessment in this kind of placemaking projects or uh, community design projects. 
uh, if we, if you allow me to to add something to to your comment, it's about uh, we know the difference between what the community wants and what the the the, the government or, or the authorities thinks that the, the community needs or wants. But there, the third player in this question is 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 the Arctic itself. Uh, is the Arctic thinks that he knows everything, and the community is is the uh, ego of only the a recipient. Yes, is only a recipient to his uh, measure. Uh, I mean, ideas uh, or great ideas. So this is the third player that we have to consider. <laughs> Thank you. I think Dr. Sanin highlighted this uh, when he yes, talked yes. about uh, uh, yes. being an architect doesn't mean that you know anything or you want to uh, show your project or show yourself. Yes. I yes. think we can stay for a more for another one hour, but uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Professor Sanin. This is really one of the most interesting discussions that we had in our Kaki Talks. Uh, I'm sorry again that we had to lock uh, the meeting. Uh, I keep receiving on my WhatsApp and in our beaches that people can't enter, but, but I had to do this. I'm really sorry. And uh, the record will be posted in our YouTube channel, inshallah. Uh, maybe if you allow us, we can add you uh, to our page so you can answer any question coming from uh, our members okay. and friends. Thank you very much. You are really honored by having you today. Thank you. And, and hopefully you will join us again and showing us more Happy. of your projects. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate you gave me a lot of things to think about. And I'll thank you for the invitation. It was an honor and hope to see you again. Inshallah. Thank Thanks. you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you very much. And uh, sorry for giving you uh, Tahranin. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, thank you for bye. all, bye. Francisco. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Hope thank to you. see you again. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.